All right, back again with another, the next in my series of looking at Carl Bau's television program called Creation in the 21st Century. Uh, this, this, the one I'm looking at now features uh, Floyd Nolan Jones um, and is entitled... Okay, okay, I don't think I can say the title with a straight face, so I'm going to let uh, Carl Bau tell you the title. Today's program is vitally important. The title is The Gaps are enormous. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. Uh, for some reason, when I hear the title, all I can think of is like Amazing Thai or Denny O or O Pearl or uh, some German fetish videos. I don't know. I, I guess I'm a sick bastard. Uh, what can you do? So I get, I'll just get started. And it is as follows. Charles Darwin has become the icon and the father of modern evolutionary thought. Now, the concepts that he gave uh, were not new. Uh, they were recognized originally among the Babylonians and then among the Greeks and then plagiarized and adopted by Charles Darwin. Carl Bau is such a douche. Um, first of all, I would love to see even the slightest, tiniest hint of that any concept of Charles Darwin's natural selection um, or even common descent can be traced back to Babylonia. Um, some elements of common descent could be traced to the Greeks. You know, some of the some of the Greek science, uh, Aristotelian science things talked about. You know, derivation of forms and that kind of stuff that could be read into as common descent, but not for all groups, not for all things. Um, nothing like what Darwin was proposing in any capacity. Um, and absolutely nothing of, of natural selection. Uh, so to make the claim that Darwin plagiarized it, it I mean, the, to use the word plagiarized from, again, a lying sack of shit like Carl Bau, I don't know. It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty ballsy, in my opinion. So I want you to know where we really are. We have the hypothesis, which is a guess, sometime an educated guess, sometime a wild guess that has to be discarded quite rapidly. Then we have a graduation from that or a modification of that if field experiment and laboratory experimentation justify it to a theory. And if that theory holds water in every dimension and is demonstrated scientifically to be universal in its application, it becomes a law or a fact. This is the advantage of having a degree from a non-accredited from a diploma mill as opposed to actually attending college courses and something because with the diploma mill you don't actually have to know anything about the subject that you're talking about you could be absolutely 100 percent fundamentally ignorant about the scientific method and yet still feel qualified to talk about it uh, this is just the most messed up definition of, of, of how science progresses that I've ever heard well, okay, that, that's probably an exaggeration because these crea creationists are constantly surprising me. Uh, so hypothesis to theory to law, I'd love to see a source for that. Where's that from? Um, law, as first of all, theories don't become laws. All right, Law is kind of an archaic, more or less archaic uh, synonym of theory. All right, we now discuss things in theory. Laws were at a time when it was believed kind of from a view of science in which there was actually a fundamental truth to be discovered. Um, now we understand that science is constantly unfolding. I mean, there's, you know, we're always just barely scratching the surface. Uh, so there, we're never going to hit ultimate truth, or at least theoretically, we're never going to hit an ultimate truth. Uh, so it, it doesn't make any sense. There'll never be a law of evolution. It will always be the theory of evolution no matter how many hundreds of millions of observations confirm it and how many absolutely zero observations disprove it or go against it, okay? That's what he's missing here. This is, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm not going to ramble on about scientific method, but it, he's just, he's just, I think he knows better. He knows this isn't true. This is another way because the audience, the audience doesn't know better and he knows that his audience is fundamentally ignorant, so. Well, we're going to show that as Charles Darwin asserted, if his theory could not be justified in actual field experiments to show small 
mutational progressive variations from a lower life form progressively through the chain ultimately to man if that could not be demonstrated to be a long series of progressive micro changes then he said my theory would be utterly destroyed well charles we have some news for you i think my favorite kind of mining is quote mining um i don't know just that's my opinion you gotta love that okay so darwin said that unless there is a natural progression of forms from simple to complex from the simplest molecules to man that if every single transitional form isn't found his theory is utterly and totally destroyed that's what darwin said right where mr bow where did he say that at what he's doing here this asshole is he is those of us who read darwin he is quote mining chapter six of darwin called difficulties with the theory now i've discussed this in a lots of videos before they love to quote mine darwin because darwin like a lot of 19th century naturalists uh, would often introduce their ideas or introduce their their the questions people might raise with their idea by posing it as a problem they would say well now this might utterly come this might destroy my theory and then they say however and then they go to explain it why it's not a problem or why it's been solved or why um whatever the case may be and darwin did that extensively throughout origin of species um but the quote that specifically he is quote mining now it's not that whole thing that he said is a bunch of crap he's paraphrasing well if you can even call it paraphrasing from the following first why, if species have descended from other species by fine gradations, do we not everywhere see innumerable transitional forms? Why is not all nature in confusion instead of the species being as we see them well defined? That's what Darwin said. Okay? Uh, and then he goes on for the next four pages explaining that. It, it's just, it, it, again, he knows that his audience, he knows that creatorsonists people whatever nobody is going to actually look up the quote and if they do happen to if the few that might look up the quote are just going to say oh my god he did say that look at that they're not going to read the rest of it okay they're not going to research it and figure out what the context of the quote is it it it's really really tedious and annoying the gaps between living systems the gaps are enormous and by the way there is no such thing as primitive life as we're going to find from this paleontologist who has examined has excavated has studied from the trilobites all the way to the lower primates and has excavated dinosaurs with me in colorado we're going to learn that there is no progressive development of living systems there's no such thing as primitive life form all living systems are incredibly complex Bao makes a number of incorrect statements here. Is first of all, there's no primitive life. Now, this really depends on what your definition of primitive is, um, and that's not trying to split hairs or be be difficult. Uh, primitive in taxonomy or phylogeny is slightly different than primitive in common usage. Okay, uh, primitive does not mean ancestral. Uh, primitive may not even mean simple. Okay, uh, when it comes to numbers of parts, for example. Just, just hopefully I can make some sense here without rambling on and on and on. The human hand is far more primitive than the hoof of a horse. Why? Because primitive in phylogeny and taxonomy refers to closer to the ancestral condition. A human hand has five fingers, uh, five distinct fingers not fused together. Uh, that's the primitive condition in mammals. A horse has lost all of the fingers except for one its single toe okay does that make sense so it's derived it's advanced from it doesn't mean it's better it doesn't mean it's more complex in fact it's actually simpler but it's modified from the original condition therefore it is more advanced versus the human hand that's primitive okay does that make sense um, when people often will talk about things like a bacteria and they'll say the bacteria is a primitive thing that doesn't mean that we're saying it's 
the bacteria is our distant ancestor, although bacterial-like forms probably were our distant ancestor. A modern bacteria, you take an E. coli bacteria from the human gut and say it is primitive. I don't, nobody's saying that it doesn't have the exact same amount of evolutionary history as we do, okay? It's its ancestors lived at the same time our ancestors did back to the beginnings of life. It has evolved as long as we have. It has had whatever. When we say it's primitive, we mean that it doesn't it shares a lot of characteristics with the with the common ancestor, more of the characteristics in in, in many ways than we might do. It's single cellular, for example, which is a primitive characteristic of life. Um, it lacks a nucleus. It lacks um, membrane-bound organelles, which is more in common with, with the origins of life than things that have developed those, if so if that makes sense. And to repeat something I, I've said over and over and over again that I think needs to be said, is in, it's very common in, in creationism, in creationist talks, lectures, uh, this concept that Evolution or abiogenesis supposes a very, very simple molecules, simple abiotically generated molecules, and then a cell, even a primitive cell, by the definition I just gave, a primitive cell uh, with DNA, with uh, RNA, with repl replicative abilities, with all of the proteins and everything, cell membrane, all of that intact, and that there's simple molecules, the cell, and that we don't understand anything that goes in between it. That's not simply a false statement, okay? Um, it's not that. There is a realm in between those two extremes, and those are extremes. There's a whole world in between them that we are learning more and more about yearly. We're learning volumes about. Okay, first of all, on the, on the simple molecule end of it, uh, there are we're finding more and more and more examples in nature of these very very complex they're not they're not organically created they're inorganically created organic molecules if that makes sense that sounds like a contradiction that has to do with it has to do with the way the chemistry terms organic organic just means carbon based um it, it's basically chains of carbons with various things attached to them or in the realm of organic chemistry it's an oversimplification but we know that a whole bunch of things like amino acids, uh, long chain carbon compounds, up to up to nine nonanes in in just are created in outer space through various mechanisms. Methanes and things like that are create are common, um, inorganically produced. So we have that whole realm. We have this complex carbon chemistry that's going on, that's non life driven. Um, including all of the basic precursors of life. And then on the other realm of it, from the cell, moving down from the cell, viroids, uh, uh, things that are replicating, they're non-cellular, but they're replicating molecules, the RNA type or RNA precursor molecules that replicate themselves. Are those alive? I mean, there's actually a debate as to does this qualify as a living thing or do we call it life when it has a cell? That's a whole discussion. And those things that naturally occur, plus the ones that have been made in the laboratory um, or observed in the laboratory, uh, I mean, there's, there, the bridge between life and non-life is actually really complicated and it's observable. It's not, it's not a whole bunch of naked carbon atoms suddenly combining together and forming an amoeba, which is what the creationists want people to believe is the case, if that makes I hope I made sense there. I know it was a ramble. I wanted to use it the rest of my time uh, because I, before I go on to the next part. So, all right, I will go on to part two. Thanks.